Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is Professor Jeffrey Hodgson. Hello, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Um, hello, Lipson. I'm doing well. Thanks very much. I'm great. So we're going to hit the ground running by discussing some of your awesome papers. And the first one we will be describing is 1688 and all of that. Property rights, the Glorious Revolution, and the rise of British capitalism. Jeffrey, what was the Glorious Revolution? Oh, it's a fascinating episode in uh, British history. Uh, it's called the Glorious Revolution, but in fact, it was an invasion. It was a Dutch invasion led by William of Orange, who became King William in the following year. Um, the invasion occurred in 1688 with a huge army, which was bigger than the Spanish Armada, which didn't actually land. It was de defeated by by the forces of Elizabeth I a century earlier. Instead, the <clears throat> army of William of Orange, which was included several, several thousand people who had disembarked from uh, several hundred ships, advanced into England in the southwest. And, and without much bloodshed, there, was a, a few, there were a few deaths, a few skirmishes, but it was relatively lacking in violence. And they, the forces moved towards London and James II, who was then the king, fled and parliament was recalled. And eventually after some debate, they made King William and his wife, Mary, uh, joint monarchs, king and queen of England. And this led to a major transformation. I mean, first of all, the very fact that parliament had approved a monarch was unprecedented, normally, Monarchs uh, were by line of descent. There was sometimes just some dispute about that or contested uh, positions, rivalry over the who was going to be the monarch, but that happens anywhere. In this case, Parliament approved a monarch under legal pretext that James had uh, left the country. And this led to a new balance of power between the Crown and Parliament. And this was crucial in British political and economic development. And another factor was that previous to the invasion in 1688, Britain and Holland, the Dutch, had been at war. Instead, Britain had been allied with France and Spain. Uh, during the 17th century, Britain fought three wars against the Dutch. What 1688 did was to change those alliances, to reverse them completely. So now Britain was an ally of the Dutch. In fact, it had a Dutch king. And its enemies, its new enemies, were France and Spain. And that plunged Britain into a series of wars. War started immediately against France, who even tried to invade in 1690. And there was continuous war uh, albeit punctuated by a few years of peace here and there. But mostly Britain was at war for most of the years between 1688 and 1815, which is over 100 years later. And of course, 1815 is the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. This is a massive period of disruption with huge wars unprecedented in their scale which led to enormous pressure on Britain to modernize its administration and its military machine. And this in turn led to major changes, including the financial revolution, uh, the development of a modern financial banking system with the, after the inauguration of the Bank, Bank of England in 1694, and also a modern state administration. Now, I've given you a brief account of uh, what happened, uh, we can highlight some of those issues more later, if you wish. Yes, I, I was but just about to ask you, what were the implications of the Glorious Revolution? Okay, that's, uh, that's a good question, because I've pointed some of them, but my argument is not shared completely by others. I, mean, I was very much interested in an earlier article by uh, co-authored by Douglas North, uh, who became a Nobel laureate, and Barry Weingast on 1688. And this was published uh, in 1969, the big, big part, 1989. 
uh, to, um, which was 300 years after the events which occurred. And they made a, an argument which carries some truth. They did, like myself, we, 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 I agree with them on the fact that the balance of power was shifted between the Crown and Parliament. That's an important thing. But they emphasized the security of property rights. And I, I think property rights um, didn't become dramatically more secure as a result of uh, 1688 and the following year, uh, legal settlement following that, uh, following that. In fact, the property rights were secure for hundreds of years earlier. I'm not the only person to say this. Several historians have pointed this out. But perhaps uh, exceptionally in Britain, unlike some other countries in continental Europe, the, proper, the legal system was fairly well established. It was not uncorrupt, it was not unbiased. All sorts of things were wrong with it, but uh, the landed property owners had relative security, not complete security. And there were confiscations of property. For example, Henry VIII confiscated the, uh, the land owned by the church, the dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, but Britain was relatively advanced in having a legal system well before 1688. Um, what was problematic for the development of capitalism, which is the issue that concerns North and Weingast and other economic historians, trying to link 1688 with the Industrial Revolution and the development of capitalism, what's crucial in my view is not so much the security of property rights, but the change in their nature. And this didn't occur immediately after 1688. It took um, more than a century to begin to wash through and have an effect. What I'm referring to in particular is the removal of feudal entails on property rights, which were designed to keep landed property in the families of rich and influential people, and instead to move to a more open, competitive land market where land could be used to mortgage and borrow money to fi finance things, including industrial entrepreneurship. But that transition was long drawn out, it took more than 100 years, and even in the 19th century, and even into the 20th century, much of land is still tied up with these feudal arrangements, hangovers from feudalism. Uh, but some transition was required, and that did occur uh, in the later decades of the 18th century and throughout the 19th century. And for me, that's much more crucial than the issues that North and Weingast raised, although I agree with them on some points. And Jeffrey, there's also an argument that after the glorious revolution, property rights became more insecure. Yes, that's made by some people. And in a sense, that's right. I mentioned there's some insecurity before, I'm not denying existence, but there's additional sources of insecurity by the fact that Parliament had more power. I mean, Parliament abolished some property rights. And one, one example of that is they, towards the end of the 18th century, they got rid of these systems where uh, positions in the state, of official posts in the state, that's as Samuel Pepys had, he had a, an official role in, in the state machine. He, his family bought that role. And this was, this was a, a, a commonplace way of doing things. If you wanted a position, you would bid for it. And the person that paid the highest money would be the person appointed. It would not be an appointment on merit. It would be instead an appointment on who had the cash and the connections to make the deal. And, and this system was was uh, wound down and marginalized eventually by Parliament. So th and that was a property right that got abolished. Well, and in the 18th century, we had the abolition of slavery, also led by Parliament. And that was an abolition of a of, of property right, albeit with compensation, but nevertheless, it was an abolition. So there's examples like that of Parliament having more power and also restricting or removing or abolishing some particular kinds of property rights for good or ill. I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, I'm simply saying that power meant had certain consequences. And Jeffrey, 
please comment on the, the role played by played by the glorious revolution in transforming the financial and monetary sectors in in England. Yes, I think that's a crucial question. I mean, it's well established by historians that uh, the 1688 led to a financial revolution. Of course, there were stirrings of financial development before, which stemmed from the fact that during the second half of the 17th century, England and Britain were growing commercially. The British Empire was growing. Uh, the slave trade, with all its uh, dreadful uh, occurrences, was also increasing. Economic growth was, was, was relatively sustained after the Restoration in 1660, or even earlier, uh, throughout the uh, uh, 17th century. Now, that required the development of finance. Trade requires finance. So certain things happened before 1688, like the reform of mortgage law in the 1670s. But I think it's generally also agreed that the huge demands of war and developing national defense after 1688, which were unprecedented in scale, war, of course, happened before, but these new wars were unprecedented in scale, and they put enormous pressure on the state to raise money. And the fact the state debt increased gradually right through the 17th century, reaching a peak at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. It was huge, more than 200% of uh, G GDP at the time. Now, that required a modern or modernized financial system with several features. It required a central bank. As I mentioned a minute ago, the Bank of England was founded in 1694, four years after the Glorious Revolution. But that was just one step amongst many. It, it, it didn't become the central bank as lender of last resort until several decades later that had to develop. Also, to sustain it, we needed a system of supportive financing so that the national debt could be financed, the interest payments and so on. And that required the development of credit markets, uh, the development of uh, derivative markets, the selling and buying of debt, and that all that took decades to develop. But the first 20 or 30 years after 1688 were crucial in what's called the financial revolution. So we have several important studies. There's a great book, a classic book by Dixon on this, um, and, and which show the importance. We have other studies which show the importance of this growing finance, this growing tax base, this growing borrowing and lending on what uh, uh, some people call the sinews of war. There's a book by Brewer with that title. In other words, developing the muscle power for the British state to defend itself and to uh, rival the, uh, its, its enemies, particularly France and Spain. So these transformations were, were, were extremely dramatic and important and consequential. And arguably, they laid the foundations for partly for financing the, the Industrial Revolution, which occurred, most historians say, about 1760, began and goes on into the beginning of the uh, 19th century. Finance played a crucial role. I mean, uh, my studies shown um, that uh, the financial availability of finance for the private sector, for private sector development and industrialization was limited and constrained in a number of ways, but nevertheless, it was present and there were markets uh, for debt, there were borrowing systems, mortgaging, and also the private banking system developed, particularly in the latter part of the, um, the 18th century. Jeffrey, how crucial was collateral as a lever for economic growth? Um, I, I think it's generally crucial in, in, in economic development. I mean, if I digress a bit from England for a minute, if you look at the problem of development around the world, um, several studies show that finance is central to the story. It's not the only, only factor. I mean, the, uh, reducing corruption, increasing the efficiency of state administration, uh, uh, appropriate governance, all these things are important too. But financial development seems to be a precondition 
or a major component in economic development for developing countries. And we can look at uh, countries that have developed, like Japan, and we can see that component in operation. And that was true for England or for Britain more broadly as well. Okay, but as I say, I think that it wasn't as sort of like turning a switch on. It wasn't a sudden development. Finance, financial institutions take a long time to develop, and all sorts of institutional devices have to be contrived and tested and modified through time. And this took decades, if not centuries, in the English case. So the Industrial Revolution had access to finance. We have evidence of people like Bolton and mortgaging, and the mortgaging would depend on assets being used as collateral. So Bolton, Bolton and Watt, when they were developing their steam engine business, mortgaged some of their assets, their buildings and also land, and they that, that land was alienable, it was saleable, so banks could lend mortgages on the basis of using that land as collateral. But the conversion of land into collateral was a slow process. It partly occurred by enclosures, which came in waves, and there was one big wave at the end of the 18th century, and another big wave in the first half of the 19th century. So the enclosure of lands from previous commons, which had important downsides as well, had the upside of making land alienable, so it's saleable, so owners of those lands could, in principle, use it to borrow money to uh, finance uh, various projects, including entrepreneurship. But they could also spend the money on conspicuous consumption, and uh, luxury goods, or whatever. There's no automatic channel. But the channels became available as land became more alienable and more land could be used as collateral. Jeffrey, property rights are essential, but they're not sufficient to explain long-term economic growth. What gave property rights the impetus to unleash the Industrial Revolution? Well, um, property rights have several aspects. Um, th this is standard in some Roman law, it's also in other legal systems. Um, Britain adopted elements of Ro Roman law after the Romans as well as during the Romans um, in the uh, early med med or med or the medieval period. Um, um, Roman law also, also was in, became influential uh, th throughout Europe. And under Roman law, pr property has different aspects. A number of authors like um, legal specialists have uh, uh, explained this. One, one, one in particular that comes to mind is uh, the British legal theorist Tony Honore, who wrote a great a classic article on this in 1961. So property consists of things like Ownership rights, the right to sell something, the right to use something, the right to use the fruits of something, the right to change something, and there's several others. There's a half a dozen or more other aspects of property rights. And what we find in our everyday lives today, different aspects of those rights are available to us. And if we own a home or uh, on land, we will have some rights in, in terms of use and using the fruits, but we won't necessarily have rights to change the use of the building from a, a domestic dwelling to a factory. We wouldn't have that right necessarily. It would depend on the legal agreements and the prevailing law at the time and the planning authorities. So even when we own many rights, we don't have complete rights. Um, and and that, uh, having complete rights is exceptional, if not non-existent. There's always residual rights which remain with the state. And this is often missed by economists who just blandly talk about property rights without distinguishing between these different aspects. And it is very important to distinguish between them to understand the underlying, underlying dynamic of a financial system based on property rights. And your point about collateral is relevant here. Collateral um, implies alienability, the ability to sell, because if you go to a bank for a loan, the, the bank will say, what well, will take possession of the asset if you default on your loan repayments. And that's a crucial device to get a secured loan from a bank. In many countries, that doesn't work very well. Mortgage arrangement, arrangements may exist, but they're often insufficient because of poor land registries, uh, corruption, all sorts of other reasons. 
And this is an important agenda item. It's not just, just economic history here which matters. It's also the development process in other countries, which is one of the main reasons why this, is, this episode is so important for us. Exactly. I, I, Jeffrey, I read y- your paper in its entirety. And the, while, while reading it, an f- interesting point was permi- permeated in my mind, the bourgeois. How important was the bourgeois class to economic growth? Because in your article, you contend that the role of the, the bourgeois was exaggerated. Yes, I, th- I think this is an, another important question. Now, we use the term bourgeois, I use it, and you just used, used, used it. And, and of course, that reminds us of Marx. A kind of Marx. Now, so I think uh, we, a lot of the framing of the issues in this historical discussion uh, has been influenced by Marx. So, I mean, often to good effect, because Marx was a great systematizing theorist. And it's uh, unavoidable that his legacy has some influence on us. But there's problems, I think, in Marx's account. And, and one of the categories, one of the concepts which is difficult to reconcile with the facts is Marx's notion of a bourgeois revolution. Okay, So you have this schema in Marxism of not only different periods of society. We have classical society, feudalism and then a transition to capitalism, and then, according to Marx, this will be followed by socialism. Um, That's the future, though. Um, Not only those phases in history, but at each phase, or each phase is marked by the supremacy of one particular class. So the nobility or aristocracy dominate during, during feudalism, and then the transition to a capitalist system according to Marx, means the bourgeoisie rises and becomes dominant. And then under socialism, according to Marx, the working class or proletariat become dominant. Now, I think that aspect of Marxist analysis is flawed. Or it doesn't, it's very difficult to force it into these facts. Now, we can define the bourgeoisie as, as uh, merchants, entrepreneurs, uh, manufacturers and so on, and these did exist. There was plenty of them uh, for years or decades before 1688. There were small manufacturers all over the place. This is before the Industrial Revolution, and, and they existed. And of course, merchants were extremely important for hundreds of years before 1688. Merchant trade occurred and got over greater and greater distances uh, for, for the preceding 100 years. So they existed, but they they politically weren't dominant. They They didn't they, they, uh, they do not characterize the, the great struggle in the Civil War, for example, which preceded 1688. I'm referring, of course, to the conflict between um, uh, Roundheads and Cavaliers, Cromwell and his forces against the king, which occurred from 1642 to uh, 1649, uh, with some researchers afterwards, um, and led to Cromwell's protectorate, which ended in the protector ended in, in, in 1660. Um, now, that, that struggle was not bourgeois versus ca- aristocrats. Aristocrats were on both sides. Bourgeois were on both sides. Upper and lower gentry were on both sides. Ordinary people, laboring people, workers were on both sides. It, it doesn't clearly mark out. People have done the work, the empirical work, to show this. Um, and neither does 1688 lead to bourgeois supremacy in the Marxist scheme. But Britain remains and is still very much an aristocratic society, even today. Okay? Even today, aristocrats own most of the land in this country. Surveys have shown that. So, okay, we do have, a, we have big capitalists, we have big capitalist corporations, they're very important, but it's not a simple transition of class power, as Marx put it. So I think in understanding the power relations, we have to drop the market, the Marxist categories of bourgeois supremacy. We can still talk about social class, that's important, but it's not one class replacing another in power. Classes I, I do not simply gain power. They're not you know, simple elements of power expression. States are much more complex. States involve multiple interests, multiple lobbies. They're pluralistically 
constructed as associations of interests and lobbies, which represent partly the capitalist part, small capitalists, big capitalists, workers, trade unions, associations, scientific advice, aristocrats. All these lobbies are within the state. It's not simply an instrument of the power of one class. I think this really requires the abandonment of a crucial element of the Marxist uh, approach, which doesn't undermine the importance of the contribution of Marx and Marxists more generally. Jeffrey, are, are there differences between the between British aristocracy and aristocracy elsewhere, for example, in French or Germany? Yes, um, there, there are big differences. I mean, the uh, first of all, the the uh, um, fact that to, to start with England, the relative stability of England for the last few hundred years since 1688 uh, has meant that the aristocrat aristocracy has been modified in character only piecemeal meal through time. By contrast, in continental Europe, we have had huge revolutions in that period and also invasions. Of course, in France, there was the famous revolution in 1789, French Revolution, also successive revolutions in France after that. Germany went, also went through invasions. Uh, there's a Napoleonic invasion and a heg brief hegemonic control by Napoleonic forces, followed by 1848, followed by other, uh, the, the Prussians, the Franco-Prussian War, uh, and, and, and a revolution in 1918-1919, uh, which transformed Germany into a, a republican system. And then subsequently that, you have the Nazis and you have the invasion by the Allies. All that's gone on in Germany in a this period of 200 years. And the British social structures have been much more stable and ossified by comparison. That is one huge difference between continental Europe and, and the British case. All right. And, and, and Jeffrey, would you say that the British aristocracy is more capitalist in outlook? Um, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. It's not, it's not a bad question, but it's tricky to answer. I, I think that... How would you begin to answer? I think it is about outlook, as you say, and it's about what motivates people, which is partly an issue of culture and values. Now, one mistake we might make and we should avoid is assuming that everyone has the same values and the same objectives. Yes, we do live in a society which is dominated by money and profit and monetary gain for good or ill. Okay, that's a fact. Um, but that doesn't mean that other motives are not also present. One, one feature of the British feudal aristocracy was a concern for prestige and power based on land ownership. Now, just to a degree, that still exists. This is not simply a profit-seeking motive. It's a motive to be connected with the right people and perhaps our political or social influence over other people through those kind of connections. And we can observe that in our contact with uh, elements of British society in government and elsewhere going on to this day. Okay, I mean, a lot of people um, you know, are concerned about making money I and mean, we all like to make a bit of money and we all like to improve our standard of living, but we're all with mixed motives. And I think those mixtures are, are very much a cultural phenomena, phenomenon, and they also reflect on our historical past. So I think those elements are, 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 of, of difference of outlook are also persistent. I'm interested in the British aristocracy, Jeffrey. Based on my reading, it appears that the British aristocracy was not only a bit on the right, but also more dy dynamic and broad thinking in its outlook. Yes, that may be true, I'm, but I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, the, the lack of stability of other aristoc aristocracies makes it difficult to compare. But um, I think the French uh, ar you know, aristocracy, the ones that survived or became implanted at the top of French society after the revolution, um, they also have a dynamic outlook. I mean, very often, uh, nationalism is a crucial element. 
Um, and so uh, a British aristocrat today might be nationalistic, there's different political points of view amongst the aristocracy, of course, but nationalism would actually want make people want to uh, orientate themselves or to support or invest in uh, economic development in some way, which would be which would be supporting capitalism and, and uh, maybe in being involved in enterprise, large corporations and so on. Another example which is very important is Japan. Because, as you know, the major restoration of 1868 changed Japan from a feudal society very quickly, very abruptly, into a modernizing society, it became a capitalist society with a financial system and so on. And that was led by the aristocracy. The, the Meiji was the, was, the, was the emperor. And the Meiji restoration was the restoration of the power of the emperor, who, in alliance with others, lower down the social hierarchy, created this huge movement for the modernization of Japan. Uh, and uh, so, th so this um, progressive aspect of aristocratic thought is also found in other countries. The, 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 the major re restoration is an important event in world history, and I cannot refer to it without mentioning Yukichi. I'm a fan of Fukuzawa Yukichi the man who, who made Japan a, a mother nation by many accounts. He's mentioned in, Al, in Alan McFarlane's book, yeah. making the, the making of the modern world. And in McFarlane's book, he also refers to the dynamics between aristocracies in Britain and elsewhere. Yeah. It seems- I, that, I, haven't, it seems, I haven't read that book. Oh, you, you, I take you the point. Yeah, uh, uh, well, Alan McFarlane's book, The Making of the Modern World, is quite simple and easy to read. I thought it's, it's maybe over 200 pages. I read it online. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for the recommendation. Yeah, but, I've uh, read some of his other work. Yeah, Alan McFarlane is, is, a, is a brilliant scholar. But just, yeah, is it, is it? I'm listening, I've been listening to you keenly, and I'm getting the impression that at some point you may write a book arguing that war drove the industrial revolution am i correct and that's very perceptive of you lipton that's right on the ball I, i've been so fascinated by this topic that i couldn't uh, get away from it and I, i'm i've actually nearly completed the first draft of, of a book and and does include that very uh, argument that war was a major factor in right driving the industrial revolution i'll give you one example Again, I mentioned uh, earlier Bolton and Watt, the steam engine business. And Watt developed the steam engine from an earlier precedent. And that was a Newcomen engine by, by Thomas Newcomen from Cornwall in uh, 1710. He, he started producing his uh, Newcomen engines. And, and Watt was a great engineer, and he thought of an adaptation which would make the engine much more efficient, and it did. The problem he had is that the, the cylinder in which the piston moved, it was different from modern steam engines, but nevertheless, it still had a cylinder and it had a piston. They couldn't get the bore of the cylinder accurate enough to seal, uh, to, 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 to be efficient. New, the Newcomen engine worked without that. What Watt required is a more accurate bore. He got that in the this, this, uh, late uh, 1800s from a colleague in the Midlands who took out a patent for boring cannon, okay? So he was making money by boring cannon, more accurately, cast iron carrot cannon, for military uses. So that innovation of more accurate boring of cylinders came from the military and it was seized upon by Watt and became part of his steam engine, and it made his steam engine possible. So this is an example of military innovation spilling over into the civilian world of steam engines, which were used at the time for pumping water out of mines. Okay, so mines could go deeper. That's tin mines and coal mines and so on. So it's absolutely important to see these connections and the way the complex ways in which war affected the Industrial Revolution. And there's also 
an another point, Jeffrey, who is responsible for commercial, or should I say, who was responsible for commercializing these inventions at the time? Was the government involved or was it the private sector? Uh, it was both. Um, the, the, what happened is that the patent system, which was not universally used, and it was quite expensive to use, developed uh, from the 1600s through to the 1700s and became more usable by entrepreneurs and innovators in, in the early decades of the of 1700s, of the 18th century. And so by the time Watt and, and Morton and Watt came along, patents were being used by people to protect their innovation. So we have an institution which is run by the state, which is the patent office, protecting intellectual property for, for inventors. Now, patenting was not always used. As I said, it was expensive, and several important innovations were not patented. But nevertheless, we can see there already that there are importance uh, in this period. So that's one way the state was 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 uh, was helping uh, by supporting a patent system. In other ways, they they were commissioning stuff. Um, I mean, you may have heard the story of, about longitude. There's a great book and a great film on it. It's about Harrison's clocks. In the early 1700s, again during war, um, there was great problems navigating these big, big expensive warships around the around the oceans because they couldn't calculate longitude accurately. Longitude required a clock in the ship set at Greenwich time, so they could judge how far east or west the, the ship had traveled according to the sun and stars. That required an accurate clock or chronometer. And so as a result of a huge wreck in 1777, when four warships were completely wrecked, of the Scilly Islands because of a miscalculation of longitude, the government set up a prize for an accurate chronometer. And that's the story of the Harrison clocks. And if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, I thoroughly recommend them both because it's a great story. And what happened, a, tra a tragic side to it as well, but what happened, you had this very important innovation of accurate timekeeping prompted by military need. Uh, and of course, it spills over into every, everyday life. We have watches and uh, more accurate time taking, keeping for, uh, uh, thereafter. So that's yet, yet another example of, of, of this interaction between the private sector and the public sector. Yes, and one, uh, one other era of interaction was coffee houses. Am I correct? Were, were coffee houses also frequented by public sector officials? Because there is data suggesting that the social capital embedded by coffee houses to an extent drove the industrial revolution because it increased trust and lowered transaction costs. Um, are you talking about coffee hold tenure of land? No, 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 I say coffee houses. So people sitting in a coffee house eating, developing oh, coffee houses. capital and trust. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's a, that's a good, great point too. I mean, th this was before the era of, of when there were many universities. When Brit England only had two universities at this time in, this, in the 18th century, Oxford and Cambridge. It's now I've got hundreds, but, uh, but it had only two then. And so um, scientific development and innovation and engineering, all these things we take for granted now, uh, occurred amongst amateurs and some commissioned uh, uh, people commissioned by rich, rich aristocrats or by the state or whatever. And it was dispersed and meeting together to share ideas and discuss, as you say, in coffee houses, particularly in London, was an ex important uh, mechanism of, of a scientific interchange, sharing ideas, criticism. And we have some accounts of how they worked and it was fascinating to see, it's fascinating to read how, how they used quite sharp criticism of each other's ideas to, to help every, each other develop and, and deal with problems uh, and anticipate some problems that may occur with the argument. And this, uh, this became in later institutionalized in things like the Royal Societies, which, which grew up in the late uh, 1600s and through into the 18th century and the 19th century and became very important before the rise of university system and the development of further universities in England and Scotland. 
Mm. Brian Cowan has a book titled The Social Life of Coffee, The Emergence of the British Coffee House, and David Sunderland has a book detailing the role of social capital in augmenting the industrial revolution. Yeah, I, I think that, that those are great arguments. Um, uh, I, th I think I mean, there was um, a lot of the, the, I mentioned Bolton and Watt again, which I find particularly interesting. And they were not located in London, they were located in the Midlands near Birmingham. And, and they, they developed something called the Lunar Society. Yeah, I'm from the Lunar Society. Uh, yeah, it wasn't exactly coffee houses, but it had a similar function. And it had some great thinkers, like Joseph Priestley, several others, all meeting together every month when there was a full moon, hence Lunar, Lunar Society. And they, they really had some amazing ideas and conversations. The accounts we have of this, of what's going on. I mean, they, these were part of the scientific revolution of the time. I mean, it was just it was a combination of science and engineering. Both Bolton and Watt were individually involved, uh, along with these other great scientists and thinkers. Uh, and they're, they're amazing in what they achieved. And it does underline your point about, of the importance of of social connections and networks and sharing knowledge and intense uh, probing of ideas. And this was what made the period very, very interesting and probably explains a lot of the advances uh, that began at that time. P Pearson and his co-author in a recent journal, they also complement this thesis, arguing that business networking promoted industrial the industrial revolution yes i i think that's un undeniable it's yeah, undeniable the, the literature on this subject matter is quite rich yes i agree fully yeah because and there's a lot a lot of it too um, and, and you net, net, i think they're absolutely essential when well, this is emphasized by late authors as well like marshall with the industrial districts and this idea has been revisited by in a modern context and also the early context by several authors. And one of the explanations for what's going on is really about knowledge sharing and knowledge, knowledge development and proximity being important for that. The you know, question is today, can we do it by, by, by video link as, as we're talking now? Perhaps to some degree we can, but those more intimate links are also, I think, important and explain the clustering of innovation and the clustering of different types of enterprise as a modern example would be Silicon Valley, which again has been studied for its networks and its complementarities and its degrees of cooperation between entrepreneurs and the way that finance also cooperates with uh, corporate life. Jeffrey, the truth is that quality Schumpeterian growth cannot occur without trust and social capital. That's right. And this is one of That's the right. reasons. This is one of the reasons why East Asian countries have done so well. Social capital in East Asia, in East Asia, according to some studies, are relatively higher than other places in the developing world. Yeah, I think there's two two point points you're making there. The first point is that capitalism, although it's driven by profit, cannot be driven by profit alone. If capitalism is driven by profit alone, it becomes de degraded. It does require collaboration, trust, networking, all these things we just talked about. So capitalism has to be impure, as I argue in some of my works, to be sustainable as a system. And this means that those on the left and those on the right who say that capitalism is just a profit motive system, the left to dismiss it and the right to support it, miss the point. They miss the, the fact that the, the, there must be a mixture of motives uh, there now on your second second question is about the relevance of this to East Asian countries. Yes, I think it's highly relevant. I think the traditions of cooperation, say in Japan, and collective endeavour, do uh, have created a culture which has been more conducive for advance. Um, Japan is uh, more developed than China, but we can see those element, elements in terms of GDP per capita. I'm talking about not in terms of overall size of the economy, but we can see these elements in, in China too. So China too is a very mixed system. It has state involvement. It relies on local networks or clans, uh, several studies indicate, and it also requires markets. So it combines all those elements into a dynamic system. 
there's an equivalent story for Japan, Singapore, other countries which have been well studied, and we can learn a lot from these examples. The diverging paths in the, in the development of Japan and China are explicable by their status development system. When I say systems, Japan approach state led growth in, in no sorry japan approached status development and china invested in state-led development the state in china is far more powerful than the state in japan the japanese believed in industrial policy the chinese state is saying we're advocating industrial policy but the state must also be involved so if you're doing business you ought to contact the state that's the difference yes. I agree with you. I, I'm, the, the first and the difference is there's a, both systems have an important role for the state, but in China, I agree the state does more. I mean, it's even involved in corporate bodies, in corporate governance, even in private corporations. They have a representative of the party, typically on their board of directors, and that kind of mechanism, which uh, makes sure the state uh, has uh, some power over these corporations. That, that, that doesn't happen in, in the same way in Japan. So J Japan um, J Japan had a, a period of state-led growth. Um, the, the early development of Japan after the Meiji Restoration was very much led by the military, the needs of military power and military development, using private enterprises, but also much very much driven by military need. After the uh, 1945 defeat in the Second World War, Japan developed this system of, 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 of networks and collaboration between large corporations and financial agencies, which did play, uh, play an more important role alongside what's called MITI, um, the Ministry for International Trade and uh, uh, Te Technology and, and, and Development in Japan. And the, the MITI system gave the uh, state an important leading role. But I agree with you, it's not the same as what's happened in China. And to some extent, Japan is, uh, the, the, the thing role of things like METI is, is diminished and, and the corporate power is taken over. Jeffrey, we often discuss separation of church and state and economic freedom, but I think we need a, a proper index studying the separation of business from, from the state. Yeah, I agree. Yes, there are several variations. Business and state must be separated, and the degree to which they are separated can impact economic growth. But Jeffrey, we're going to move on and briefly discuss your second paper. Much of the economics of property rights devalues property and legal rights. Jeffrey, what are you saying? That property rights, rights are monopolistic? No, I, 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 I'm in fact the opposite. I'm saying that property rights, as I tried to explain earlier, have different facets, and we shouldn't bring these together, okay? Uh, I, the, there is a school of thought in economics, which is a discipline I, from which I come, called the economics of uh, property rights. But I think they oversimplify the story. And that, that paper, which you quoted of mine, published a few years ago, explain, tries to explain why. Other authors have made similar points, so I do rely on them as well. And, and I, therefore, I make the accusation that um, they need to go deeper into property rights and understand their complex facets uh, more than they do, because they treat property, by and large, simply as a matter of possession. And I think that's only one aspect of pro property and property rights. And it relates to the point that we discussed earlier about collateral. Um, if simple control of a piece of property doesn't give you the ability to use it as collateral because you can only use it as collateral if your title, if your right to that piece of property is endorsed by a public authority, which is, and that authority is shared by the bank or whatever to whom you are going for a loan and saying, I will pledge this as collateral, uh, and they have to agree that the, the legal title exists. So, um, and also the problem of legal titling of land and buildings uh, is also neglected by the um, Economics of Property Rights School. So what I argue for in that paper is really a, 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 more, a, more, a deeper recognition of the legal complications or fast different facets of property. We should learn from law 
as well as uh, giving advice or uh, using pre presenting an analytical tools to lawyers, we should also learn from law and understand property more deeply than much of that literature. Jeffrey, do you think that we should revisit Proudhon's writings on property? So who's Curran? No, Proudhon, Pierre, the, the, the French philosopher. Uh, Proudhon, property Perron, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, Proudhon. Yes, Proudhon. Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Great book, uh, and he makes that distinction. You're absolutely right. He makes a distinction between possession and property, which is crucial. Which is not original to him. It's also found in Hegel. So I, th I think Proudhon gets it from Hegel, but it's a key a key element in in, in legal systems. Uh, the the diff distinguishing between mere possession and fuller property rights. So, for example, yeah, so he, he said property is freedom and, and property is theft. I'm, and yes. I'm surprised that few people are, at, are examining the potential of property rights to create actual monopolies outside of the financial space. So, for example, patents can constitute a monopolistic right, just like property rights. So, for example, if I buy 500 acres of land, I own that property and other people cannot use it without my permission. Yeah, that's right. Property rights often are exclusive. And they mean that you have rights and you exclude others from, from benefiting from those rights. That doesn't always occur, but that's you're absolutely right. That's a, a key feature. Um, and that's, that's Proudhon's objection. I mean, but he was an anarchist. <laughs> I'm not an anarchist. I, I think property is important to maintain autonomy. Now, property can go wrong. It can be concentrated too much in too few hands. But the remedy to that is, is not to abolish property, but to distribute it more evenly amongst the population. So I, I think property rights are important for individual and family autonomy. Uh, I, I, I think um, home ownership is important to give people autonomy alongside social housing for the poor that can't afford to buy property. Everyone should have a home of one kind. But for those that can afford it, I think home ownership is a good idea. Uh, and because uh, it does provide people with with autonomy, well, and, for, and for that reason, I think should, we should protect property rights, but n deal with the problem of the very highly unequal distribution. Well, I'm a libertarian, so I'm not particularly in favor of redistribution, but I don't object to redistrib redistribution, redistribution if it is done by the free market. So, for example, recently I wrote an article contending that the free market has a trickle down effect. Because of market-based in market-based innovations, some luxury commodities are now more accessible to ordinary people. So this is a trickle-down effect and the redistributive effect of free markets. But there is also the aspect of the land tax, and again, that the land tax could be used to in encourage property-owning democracy. If I own ten thousand acres of of land, because of the tax, I may create a few apartments or, or a new housing community. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I wouldn't describe myself as libertarian, but I agree with you about a land tax. I, I think that would be a, a good way forward. And it's a form of property which, which, although it's problematic in some ways, is more easy to tax as wealth than other forms of wealth, which are more difficult to identify and track down because they can move to intangible assets, can be moved about internationally or globally these days. But land is, is more, more easy to track down and it needs proper surveying and valuing, which is not easy, but and I agree, agree with you, that's a good way forward. Yeah. And, I, I mean, and, sorry. Yeah. And, and the, this is our la, my last point, that the land tax actually had broad-based support years ago. So Henry George was an advocate yeah. of the land tax and the black socialist Hubert Harrison, often called the black Socrates. Yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it goes also back before Henry George, it goes back to Thomas Paine. Uh, I'm a great fan of Thomas Paine, um, who in America is seen as libertarian, but in Britain he's seen as a, a kind of welfare state liberal. Uh, and so there's different perceptions of Paine, but in any case, I think he's a great writer. And he has some there's hid, hidden depths in his writing. And he talks about this problem of inequality and has got some very ingenious solutions, which still are relevant today.
So perhaps we share an interest in pain. I don't know, Thomas yeah. Paine. But J Jeffrey, I I am enjoying our conversation, but unfortunately, I have to wrap up. So bye. But it's a pleasure to speak to you, Jeffrey. All right. It's a great pleasure for me. I've been much enjoyed our conversation. All right then. Bye.